to this, the fifth meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2018. Can I remind members and others in the room to switch phones and other devices to silent? The first item on the agenda is consideration of two new petitions. At this stage, we will not hear evidence on these petitions. Petition 1680 on private water supplies in Scotland was submitted by Angela Flanagan. The petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to review the Private Water Supply Scotland Regulations 2006, produce guidance for all relevant bodies to comply with the Private Water Supply Scotland Regulations 2006, transfer the regulatory powers over the drinking water quality of private water supplies from local authorities to the Drinking Water Quality Regulator for Scotland, and ensure an equal right of appeal in the planning process where objections on public health grounds are intimated by interested parties. Members have a copy of the petition and a spice briefing. The petitioner raises a range of issues in relation to private water supplies, including inconsistent compliance with an EU directive. The petitioner is of the view that her suggestion of ensuring an equal right of appeal in the planning process would avert unduly preferential treatment of commercial developers over individual households. She is also of the view that developers would not be able to pass on provision and maintenance costs for essential services to individuals or their communities. As members will note from our briefing paper, the Scottish Government has no current plans to review the regulation of private water supplies following the recent introduction of the Water Intended for Human Consumption Private Supplies Scotland Regulations 2017. Furthermore, the Scottish Government introducing the Planning Scotland Bill to the Parliament on 4th December 2017, and Ministers have specifically ruled out the introduction of a third party right of appeal as part of this bill. And I wonder if members have any comments. Um, um, thank you, Convener. This strikes me as, as um, connected to uh, uh, one that we passed on to the Environment Committee um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, it certainly has the same sort of intonations, and I know that the Environment Committee met and discussed that that that, um, uh, that petition was it uh, earlier on this week, and uh, that they've, they've decided to to move that on as well. And I think if, again. I'm, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they're meet, meeting with Scottish Water in a couple of weeks yeah. and uh, and they're raising no specific, is that specific. You sit on that committee? Yeah, 17th of April. Yeah. And I wonder whether or not th this is sufficiently linked <coughs> to that uh, petition that, uh, that, that, that they could almost be. Uh, so you're suggesting yeah. referring it immediately? Well, I'm wondering, well, wonder, considering that, that, that we, we heard a uh, petition, you know. Um, We've heard that petition, and it's been moved to the Environment Committee on particularly around the quality of drinking water in in, in areas and, and the the way that the the water board uh, are, are, are are conducting themselves. That they're going to be questioned with you know uh, quite soon on that whether or not there's a way that we can link this to that one. Okay. Other views, Michelle. Um, yeah. I mean, the slight problem with this this petition is I think it's it's about two things. So it's about water quality on one level, which is, is what the previous petition was, was predominantly about, but it's also about um, that responsibility and, and the, some of the planning regulations that sit around that, um, because obviously private water supplies covers a myriad of things, so that you, you've got whole estates that have a, a private water supply, um, and then you've got individual houses and that have private water supplies, and, and the needs of each might be different. So... Whilst on one hand I agree with, with Brian Whittle that there is a direct connection, my other concern that this is this is partly about who is responsible for a water supply and where does that planning responsibility and the handover, particularly when there's been a, a, a perhaps a, a rural or isolated um, set of houses built and how does that responsibility get handed over? So I think I think there are those two elements and I'm I'm not I'm not sure I mean perhaps. Uh, Angus can answer that better, whether that element sits in the Environment Committee in the same way. Um, thanks, Commissioner. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I take on board what uh, Brian Whittle has said, but uh, the previous petition that he referred to was highlighting an issue with regard to chl chloramination. Um, and this is more, well, while there are issues with the quality of private supplies, this also involves the, the, the planning regulations um, and clearly we've got the planning bill going through um, committee at the moment. Uh, I think it's going into stage two. Um, the, the petitioner details four main asks. Um, uh, however, I think until we can get further 
information from the Scottish Government. Uh, I don't think we, the committee, uh, this committee, can take this further. Um, um, as I said, the, the, the current planning bill is going through Parliament, um, but Scottish ministers have specifically ruled out uh, the introduction of a third party right of appeal. Um, and I'm sure there are quite a number of people disappointed with that. Um, however, I think it'd be helpful to get an official response from the Scottish Government first before we consider any further action okay. uh, on, on the specific points that the petitioner has raised. So I, I don't think it would be helpful to refer it straight to um, the Eclair Committee at the moment. Would it be worthwhile flagging up to the, the, the committee, however, that this is a petition that's been flagged up to us Definitely. and perhaps provide the paperwork around it from the petitioner and that would at least inform the members in their conversations with, did you say Scottish Water were coming in? Yeah. So we could do that. We could ask the Scottish Government for more information. I think specifically on third party right of appeal or equal right of appeal as it's now called, that will be getting debated in the Parliament. I mean, the, the Scottish Government has a view. I think the individual parties will be coming to a view. The committee will be coming to a view. So in, in a sense, that bit of it is going to be interrogated pretty strongly um, in the parliamentary process. But I think if we can agree that we would write Scottish Government um, asking for their view on the issues highlighted in the petition, and we flag up to the Rural Affairs Committee, if that's the right one. The Clear Committee. What's that? Um, environment, um, climate change okay. and land reform. <laughs> right, OK. The Clear Committee is easier. Um, re flagging up to them the, the content of the, the, the petitioner, the contents of the petition and the argument made by the petitioners in order to form further discussion. Would that be agreed? Agreed. Okay. In that case, if we can then move on to the next petition, which is Petition 1685 on log burner stoves in smoke control areas, which was lodged by Jim Nisbet, and calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to introduce legislation to prohibit the use of log burner stoves in smoke control areas. The petitioner considers that the Clean Air Act 1993 is not fit for purpose and refers specifically to Section 21 of the Act, which he considers is open to interpretation. In the background information to his petition, Mr Nisbet, Nisbet sets out his concerns that the Scottish Government is not treating the issue of log burner pollution as seriously as diesel vehicle pollution and refers to a number of research studies and media articles to support his position. The briefing paper refers to the Scottish Government's cleaner air for Scotland strategy and provides a summary of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's findings on this issue from its recent inquiry into air quality in Scotland. The report notes that the inquiry identified, quote, a gap in regulations around the installation of wood-burning stoves with conflicting guidance coming from environmental health department officials, planning regulations and building standards. The recommendations set out in the report included asking the Scottish Government to review the current regulations and to undertake research to understand the extent of pollutants emanating from wood-burning stoves. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action on this petition. Angus. Yeah, thanks uh, again, Convener. Uh, as we've just discussed, I'm um, uh, also a member of the ECLAIR Committee, um, which recently concluded its inquiry into air quality in Scotland uh, and published its report um, exactly, a, exactly a month ago. Um, and I think it's fair to say um, that we took conflicting evidence on the impact of wood burning stoves and, and the impact that has on, on air pollution. Uh, and the jury's still out on the issue. Uh, mainly due to lack of uh, available uh, data. Um, but it was interesting to hear the, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, Rosanna Cunningham, acknowledge uh, when giving evidence to the committee that the 1993 uh, Clean Air Act might need to be updated. Um, so uh, the Clear Committee asked the Scottish Government uh, to undertake research and also to review the current regulations and guidance. Uh, however, the committee is still waiting on the the government's response, um, and we await with interest because clearly uh, there is an issue, certainly another evidence that we took that uh, was highlighted that uh, um, there are issues with uh, multi-fuel and, and log-burning stoves. Okay. Do we have a time scale for the response from the Scottish Government? They must have to do it within a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Six. not sure. Okay. So the... Um, 
And my understanding is it should be within two months of the report being published. Okay, well, it's it's, it's been a month, so okay, okay. any time now. So that would be it. Would be certainly interesting to see what the Scottish government has to say, Brian. Mm -hmm. Okay, well. <clears throat> I think we should just wait and and see what the response is because obviously that's going to be the starting point for where we go with this until we know where they what the Scottish government's position is. Um, if they come back and rule against it, job done. If they come back and say they don't think there's an issue, then you know we can look at it from there. But uh, there seems very little point in doing anything till then. Mm -hmm. Fair consideration um, until the Scottish government responds. But we would be, there would be an expectation that that would be done within the expected time scale. So this is not something that's been deferred to some vague time in the future. There are quite explicit time scales for that. OK, in that case, thank you very much for that. If we can then move on to the next agenda item, which is current petitions. The second item on the agenda is consideration of continuing petitions. I have intended, I intend to change the order of petitions under this item slightly to take petition 1591 first. This is on the basis that some of the MSPs who have an interest in this petition also have other parliamentary commitments this morning. And can I welcome uh, David Stewart, Dave, Kate Forbes and Edward Mountain for this agenda item. So the next petition for consideration is petition 1591 by Katrina MacDonald on behalf of SOS NHS, a major redesign of healthcare services in Sky, Loch Alge and South West Ross. We have received submissions from the Cabinet Secretary and the Petitioner, and these are included in our meeting papers. Members also have a copy of more recent correspondence received from Councillor Ronald MacDonald. Following our previous consideration of this petition, including representations from local members, we wrote to the Cabinet Secretary regarding a possible mismatch between what she understood to be happening and what was reported to us as actually happening in terms of the redesign of health and social care. The Cabinet Secretary indicates that she has sought reassurances from NHS Highland and in her submission sets out relevant text of correspondence between the board and local councillors. The Cabinet Secretary also refers to the locality planning group, which she asked NHS Highland to establish, which should include all key stakeholders to discuss and address any ongoing local concerns. The petitioners refer to the review of out-of-house care being conducted by Lewis Ritchie, Members um, will note that the terms of reference for that review state that it will not be considering the wider redesign. However, the petitioners repeat their concern that out of hours care cannot be reviewed realistically without considering the impact of the redesign on other key aspects of local services. They are also concerned that the board has already implemented some changes without the associated arrangements being tested. They believe this to be contrary to the conditions set by the Cabinet Secretary when she approved the initial agreement. Petitioners feel that NHS Highland has not acknowledged the deeply held view within the local community that the redesign proposals are fundamentally flawed. The petitioner concludes, petitioners conclude their submission by stating that they do not have confidence in NHS Highland's ability or willingness to redesign health services that have served their community for decades in a safe and person-centred manner and reiterate the request for an independent scrutiny panel to be set up. That briefly summarises the submissions we've received, um, and I will be looking for comments in the petition, but I would um, ask members to reflect on the role of the Public Petitions Committee to consider matters of national policy or practice. We do not have a remit to intervene in op operational matters, and while that can sometimes be a fine line, I think it is pertinent reminder in respect of this petition, given the position of the Cabinet Secretary regarding her decision in the redesign and the nature of some of the concerns that have been mentioned by the petitioner. And, um, I wonder if people have comments, and I'll take um, comments from our invited guests, if you like, as, after members of the committee themselves. Brian? Yeah, thank you, Gavina. I think with this particular uh, petition, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm uh, uncomfortable with the, the way in which I think uh, NH Highland, uh, NHS Highland and also uh, the Cabinet Secretary have, have, have uh, basically conducting themselves like that. I do feel they've kind of tried to hold uh, us and the petitioners at arm's length and I do understand your the, the position that, that uh, the petitions committee is not here to, to uh, intervene in, in, sort of, in, 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 in sort of the regional uh, like this but I, I just feel uncomfortable in the way in which this, has been, uh, this, is, this particular petition has been handled um, and, uh, and I'm not sure what we do with it 
but I just want to put that on record that I don't think it's been done handled particularly well. Angus. Yeah, thanks, um, Convener. Clearly, since the, since the petition was submitted way back in October t uh, 2015, um, there have been additional issues, uh, particularly on Sky, not least the, the frequent suspension of the out of hours service at Portree, and also um, a recruitment processes on Rassi. Um, now, while it's clear that the, the Cabinet Secretary is, is adamant from the responses that we've received that there will be no reversal of the approval of the the major service change um, and that the issue is an operational matter for NHS Highland. There may be um, some, some merit in waiting for the outcome of the external review of out of hours urgent, case, uh, urgent care services in Skylar House and South West Ross, uh, which you mentioned is, is being conducted by um, Sir Lewis Ritchie. Um, it may be good to get uh, that back before uh, we, we decide to proceed any further. I mean, I'm, I'm concerned, I suppose, like my colleagues, that um, if, it, if it had all been fine, then I think there would have been a better relationship and a better conversation. I'm concerned that it has been um, a bit obstructed maybe on both sides. You know, there's been obviously a, a, an enormous difference of opinion here. But there is now an independent review having a look at it, which would suggest that, that both sides have agreed that that would be useful. Um, and I think from a petition point of view, I, I would be more comfortable if we waited to see what the outcome of that independent review was before we made a decision yeah, to close. It's, it's only looking at out of our yes. services, I think. It's not looking at the redesign, but it may, given how these things all connect to each other, it may reflect some issues which might then impact in a broader yes, question. Yes, I mean, redesign. they're all interconnected at the mm -hmm. end of the day, and, and I think that... Uh, you know, if there's a problem with out of hours and what they've put in place as part of the redesign isn't going to work, then they are going to have to rethink some of the back end of how that links in as well. So I think for me, this is about closing the loop. And I think we need to personally, I think we need to see, see you know, allow that to go through. Okay. Um, I mean, I, it is difficult, you know, it isn't our role to, to interfere in operational decisions. But, you know, somebody's petitioned us because they feel very strongly that, that the decisions that are being made are not right, and I think we need to make uh, satisfy ourselves that everything that can be done has been done to make sure that that due process has been followed. Okay. Just, uh, can I just agree with basically what's been said? I think, um, I mean, the the review that's going on is one part of a huge issue, and it's a very important part. So I think, um, although it's not, it doesn't encompass the whole issue, we'd be wise to wait. We see the outcome of that. Okay. I wonder if Kate, do you want to kick off? Thank you very much. I've, obviously, my views have been made clear at previous meetings of the committee. In a nutshell, I believe that North Sky deserves a resilient, excellent uh, access to healthcare services, and at the moment, that is not being provided in terms of, uh, particularly in terms of out of hours, which, as Angus Macdonald said, has been suspended um, semi regularly which I just believe is completely unacceptable. And that's where this platform has been very useful to discuss some of these issues. And, and thank you for the committee's work in terms of trying to get answers. And whilst the subject has perhaps moved off the main ask in the petition, which was for the independent scrutiny panel, I think that um, there are still outstanding issues that are of grave concern. The most significant development in the last six months, and it goes back to a meeting that I had with campaigners in October when they explicitly asked for an independent um, external um, review of what was going on. And uh, I know that Professor Sir Lewis Ritchie has been actively engaged with members of the public, with community councils and with frontline staff, who, and um, it's not complete yet. And whilst obviously the main remit is out of hours, you, I don't, I believe too that, I mean, it needs to be a, a wider review than just out of hours. I would hope, though, that you can't look at out of hours independently and in isolation from other issues such as beds. So if the committee was minded to wait until the outcome of that review, or at least a review was reported on, then I, I would be very supportive of that. There are hardworking staff here, um, but we need to protect them. And there's a problem if... Uh, out of hours is being uh, suspended as it is being. That to me is just completely unsustainable uh, and 
for that reason, I, I would be grateful if the committee would keep the petition open until the review has been reported. Edward. Uh, thank you. <coughs> thank you, convener. Um, if I just make a few points, if I may. First of all is that it's an interesting petition this because it seems to be working together across all parties and, and the fact that three of us are here today representing all the people that have taken a, a, a specific interest and we do work very closely together and just to remind the committee that this petition came because of a lack of trust of the way NHS Highland uh, were working and therefore the petition is still seen as very vital to the people on Sky and Rasse. And, uh, and I mean, I was there two weeks ago. I know Kate's there pretty regularly, and Rhoda and, and David are there as well. They still feel that the petition is causing the NHS Highland to focus in on the issue. As far as the Petitions Committee concerned, considering the national posi position, I think this is a national position in the sense that as far as Sky is concerned, you know, what happens in Sky will, if it works, if the review works and if, if, if something good can come of all this, it could be something that's worth all of Scotland looking at. So there is a national position on trying to resolve a local issue. Um, I, I would just say I totally agree, uh, Convener, with, with, with what you've said. This is interconnected with everything that's been brought up. And I, I'm delighted that each member of the uh, committee uh, from Brian, Angus, Michelle and Rhoda have all said that they believe that there's merit in keeping the petition open till we finish the review from Sir Lewis Ritchie. Uh, I think we've met with Sir Lewis Ritchie um, and, and we're looking forward to seeing what comes out of his review, but it's been pretty in-depth from what I can see. And uh, I think this petition will allow uh, the people on Sky to feel that, that their views are being considered and, and focused. So I, I would urge you, uh, Convener, to... To, to go with, as it appears, everyone on the committee is saying is to keep the petition open. And thank you very much for allowing me to come for a second time uh, in two weeks to your committee. The pleasure is all yours. Um, thank you for that, Dave Stewart. Yeah, thank you, Camille. First of all, can I thank the committee for allowing uh, me to come along with my colleagues. Uh, as you know, I spent many happy years on the petitions committee in the last session, and I you know what a powerful piece of work the, all the com committee members do on petitions. Um, can I first of all endorse the comments that both Kate Forbes and Edward Mount have made? My colleague Rhoda Grant has been leading within the Labour Party on this and has done a great job with colleagues uh, to fight the case for the petition. I agree wholeheartedly with their conclusions. Uh, my request is simply, can you keep this petition open until we've had the review completed? Uh, the fact that we've got such strong cross-party support as Edward Mountain has identified says a lot about the Highlands and Islands. So I'm strongly in support of the petition and my request is, please keep the petition open until we've had the review. I do have a, um, a letter of apology from Rhoda Grant and, and I maybe just highlight a couple of things that she says um, as well. She says, um, I'm support the petitions who want to keep open the petition on the major redesign. I strongly believe that building a new hospital in Broadford cannot be delayed. That said, Sir Lewis Rich's report will not cover all areas of concern expressed by the petitioner. However, it may provide a greater insight and the committee should hold the petition until they have that and can then assess what other pieces of work flow from that and indeed may be required over and above that. The people in the North of Sky need to know what services they will have going forward. There has been poor information and indeed disinformation in the process so far, as I've discovered from talking to local constituents. For example, people were told that there would be inpatient beds at Portree and now discover there will be no beds in the hospital and any beds will be in care homes. There's also a need for emergency care and step-up and step-down beds, and people need to know what services such as clinics and physio will be available. Um, and, and I guess that the point she makes about inpatient beds and outpatient beds, Sir Lewis Ritchie will have to look at that if he's looking at out of, of our services. That is something that's probably quite um, in, integral to that. So I don't know if there's any other comments from... Um, committee members on. I think people have really kind of endorsed the view that we hold on to the petition until we, we, we see the review from Sir, Sir Lewis Ritchie. Is there anything else that you want to add? No? In that case, we're agreeing um, to um, we're agreeing not to close the petition but to await the outcome of the review before we take <coughs> further consideration on the petition itself. Can I thank my colleagues, Kate Forbes, Edward Mountain and David Stewart for their attendance and can I suspend just briefly?
recommends the, the meeting with the next petition for consideration, which is petition 1480 by Amanda Copel on behalf of the Frank Copel Alzheimer's Awareness Campaign, and petition 1533 by Jeff Adamson on behalf of Scotland Against the Care Tax. Members will recall our last consideration of these petitions. We agreed to write to the Scottish Government to ask what conditions, in addition to dementia, will be covered under free personal care to people under 65. The Scottish Government's response confirms that adults with any long-term condition or those who develop dementia or other degenerative conditions under the age of 65 who are assessed as needing it will receive free personal care. The committee also asked the Scottish Government whether other services such as day services will be included given they are not currently captured by the current definition of free personal care. The Scottish Government response states that free personal care is subject to the Community Care and Health Scotland Act 2002. It is understood that the Health and Sports Committee will be the lead committee for scrutiny of the legislation to give effect to the proposal to extend free personal care to people under 65. The petitioner has submitted two written submissions, the first of which is included in our meetings papers. Due to the deadline for issuing meeting papers, the clerks were unable to include the second submission in our papers, but we received this information separately. I also understand that the submission has now been published on the petition webpage. The petitioner expresses concern about the way the extension of free personal care will be funded by the Scottish Government. As such, the petitioner suggests an alternative approach which would involve a personal care rebate. The petitioner also asks the committee to write to the Scottish Government to clarify its policy objectives in relation to the extension of free personal care and its funding approach to support its policy objectives. And I wonder if members have any comments. Michelle? Yeah, it, it does feel like the, um, the government have, if I'll be honest, to use the word, made a mistake when they've, when they've looked at how, how that funding will be distributed. Um, I hope it is just a mistake because I think um, the petitioner has, has actually quite clearly pointed out why um, the current suggestion is, is likely to backfire on the people who need it the most. Um, and I think that it would be very important that that was revisited. Um, in terms of how it is revisited, um, I would be interested to hear whether, um, I know Brian sits on the Health and Sport Committee, whether it is appropriate that they pick that up as part of the scrutiny of the legislation. Um, but I, de I definitely think it needs looking at, and I think the petitioner's proposal does make a lot of sense. Um, but I'm not sure it's for us as a committee to decide whether that's the best approach, but I do think it needs revisiting. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I think I think th th this has been raised at the uh, Health and Sport Committee as well, and, and um, my colleague, Miles Briggs, also sits in the Health and Sport Committee, and I know he was quite instrumental in, 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 in pushing forward uh, th this legislation. <laughs> I, think, I think, quite frankly, there's... Um, Consensus across all parties. Obviously, that the government have brought in this legislation. I think it's the implementation of it that uh, we're currently scrutinising, and, and uh, I'd be quite comfortable for the Health and Sport Committee to pick this up if that's what the, the rest of the petitions committee decide. So you're suggesting that we refer it to them? Uh, I, I, well, I certainly think we should uh, we should give them cognizance of, of, of this this particular petition. Maybe not pass it pass it on, but I would like to see us write to the Health and Sport Committee and give them details of, of uh, this particular petition, and, and uh, it would allow it would allow us more information uh, going forward. Especially the, the unintended consequences of the funding model, which seems to be. Um, I can't believe that nobody would intend it that the local authorities get the extra money, but there's actually not one coin extra in the in the pockets of people who have been campaigning for this to change. That doesn't make any sense to me. That's why I, said, mm -hmm. that's why I, said. I hope it is just a mistake that you know yeah. it's just not been properly thought through. So should we write to the mm -hmm. Scottish government for further clarification? I mean, I personally find it really quite confusing the the whole um, the, this whole follow up to the petition. Um, so I think if we could get some clarification, but ag agreeing that obviously it would come within the, the remit of the Health and Sport Committee for uh, post scrutiny, but um, as an initial step, I think right for further straightforward clarification. Just think if they, you know, if they have made a mistake, we need to find we need to find out. Um, I think the issue around letting the Health and Sports Committee. 
um, alive, alert them to the issues that have been flagged up around the funding model, we need to be done in time for these regulations to go through. And that's, I think, within four weeks, maybe round about that. But I do think there is a... a, a so that we would want to inform enough of that discussion with the minister around the proposal. But I do think there's a broader question here, which is might not be specifically around what they're planning for now, which is what the regulation will deal with. But that extending it, which I think is a massive thing, to extend it to people um, below 65. But the nature of the conditions of people under 65... Um, who might require free personal care, the, the kind of care they require. I mean, we asked the question, didn't we? Did it include day services and so on? I think there would, it, we may not be capturing what the scale of the problem is. I mean, I think I maybe flagged up before a particular instance that was brought to my attention of, of a young disabled woman, amazingly talented young woman, who said that her student loan was calculated as income in terms of her care package, which is, I find, astonishing. Now, that's not going to be sorted in the next four weeks in relation to the regulations that they, they're bringing forward. But I do think that part of the exploring of this issue is actually still very important, which is really to do with the second petition, which is around potentially scrapping the social care tax altogether. And I wouldn't want to lose that broader piece of work. So whether it's possible to agree to write to the Health Committee around the specifics about the funding model that's been used ahead of the regulation and ask them to factor that into their considerations, but also agree to write the Scottish Government more broadly um, round the, 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 their understanding of <clears throat> what those care needs will be and how people can be supported and, and try to get a sense, particularly in the second petition, which is it's, it's, it's predicated on the idea that um, you can't have a care tax which denies people the right to live out their lives the way that everybody else would. So it's like levelling up the playing field so people can work and can and study in the same way that other people might do. And I think it would be worth um, maybe asking the Scottish Government to, to reflect on that as well. Yes. Okay, is that agreed? So we, we do these two things. So we're, we're at a very specific issue around the regulations. We will make sure we try and inform the Health Committee from the work of the petition. But we actually ask the Scottish Government to respond to these broader questions as well. Okay, if that's agreed, we can then um, <clears throat> excuse me, move on <clears throat> to the next petition, which is the next petition 1577 by Rachel Wallace on adult cerebral palsy services. And can I welcome Murdo Fraser, MSP, for his attendance for this petition. At our last consideration of this petition, we noted that the Scottish Government had not contacted the petitioner since the beginning of 2017, despite making a commitment to work with her. The Minister for Public Health and Sport has since apologised for this lack of engagement. The petitioner and Murdo Fraser MSP have now met with Scottish Government officials to discuss the main issues of the petition. The petitioner indicates this was a positive meeting and hopes to build a constructive working relationship with the Scottish Government. The petitioner refers to several projects and evidence gathering exercises that are currently ongoing by the Government which relate to the action called for in the petition. And this information is set out in our meeting papers. The petitioner highlights that this work is still at an early stage and as such asks the committee to monitor the Scottish Government's commitments regarding the petition closely. Um, and I'll, I'll look for comments from members <coughs> or suggestions for action, but perhaps I can ask Murdo Fraser first just to give us an update from his perspective on that, the petitioners that are dealing with the Scottish Government. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Convener. And just just start by, by thanking you and other members of the committee for uh, keeping this petition alive and uh, pressing the government uh, for action. It has been quite a long uh, process, uh, but uh, we seem to be making a bit more progress. I'm pleased to say um, there was, as you um, indicated, a meeting with uh, a government official in January that I attended along with the petitioner, uh, and that actually was a very, uh, very positive meeting. There are a number of strands of work that are being taken forward, uh, which you have, you, re you have referred to and are referred to in the the papers that uh, committee members will have uh, in front of them. And the petitioner is, is, is engaged quite closely with that work and you know, is pleased to have that role. Uh, so things are, are, are progressing, and I think and, you know, we, we can now see you know, a route towards trying to achieve some of the objectives behind uh, the petition. I think the, um, wh where we are now is, is, is that while work is, is starting, 
clearly there's a lot, long way to go before we see how that work's actually going to progress. And I think what the petitioner would be keen to see is, is some time allowed to uh, let these uh, uh, work uh, uh, projects uh, proceed and see how they develop. So I think that the petitioner's view would be that uh, it might be uh, appropriate for the, the committee to certainly keep the petition alive, but perhaps revisit this issue in, in the autumn, maybe when we have a better idea how these uh, work streams are developing. I suppose <clears throat> the issue that we need to um, reflect on, I think we're, we're grateful for the progress that's been made and recognise what you have said. But the, now, <clears throat> excuse me, the time scale for the consultation and national action plan um, would have the consultation place, taking place in autumn and they run about 12 weeks. Our, I suppose my anxiety is that if we'd simply defer the petition, we wouldn't actually be looking at it again till the spring of 2019. And I think we're all very alive to the challenge presented to us by the petitioner who says she doesn't want to come back in five years' time and discover there's been no progress. Um, I mean, I'll ask other members for the use, for use but I'm wondering whether we could, we could close the petition but be explicit in saying to the petitioner that we would want to look at this again once that consultation is over. And depending on what that consultation concludes with, would inform what the petition then says. Since we can't edit a petition once it's lodged, it would give the petition an opportunity to, once she knows exactly where we are and you know where we are, that the new petition could reflect that and that would be something we would consider. So it's trying to find a way, I think, as a committee to be as helpful as possible to the petitioner and to the issues that she highlights. And we wouldn't want to create the impression simply by saying, well, we'll defer it and look Actually, realistically, it would be almost a year down mm. the line before we do that again. And I don't know if other members have comments on that, and then I can bring you back in. Yeah. Rona? I mean, I absolutely take your point, but I think it's really important to stress to the petitioner that, um, you know, we're not closing it and, and, and dis discarding it in any way at all. It's just so that it could be revisited with fresh information um, once we see the, the, the findings of the, um, the, the National Action Plan because that could alter entirely what um, she wants to bring back to the petition. So I think it's important to stress is if, if we close it, it's not because we think that this is no worth. It's just that we want to wait to, to see what comes back from the review. Mm -hmm. Brian? Yeah, I, I'm kind of, I think you, 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 the initial response is always we, can't let, you know, we must keep this going because you know, we need to answer, answer this particular uh, petition. But I think that uh, you know, on on reflection, I think that it would be really important that um, any future deliberations by this this committee uh, is to the very specific um, issues that are raised or not raised within the, 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 the that, that consultation. So, uh, as my colleague Ronan Mackay said, I think it's really important to stress how important this petition is, and that if we do close it, it's only because we want to look at the very specific issues raised out the, the back of of. Uh, consultation. Okay. Martha? I can't speak for the petitioner in relation to this matter. I don't know what particular view she would have. I think I think the the the, the advantage the petitioner has had probably is in drawing to the government's attention the fact that there's been an issue to be dealt with. And I think that the uh, interest that yourself, Commissioner, has taken in this and other uh, committee members has been very helpful in encouraging um, the Scottish government ministers and officials to, to take this seriously. And we're now seeing some more progress. So I suppose my only concern about closing the petition would be that, you know, somehow the foot is taken off the accelerator if, if that were to happen. But clearly it's up to committee members to decide how they, how they take it forward. Yeah, that, is, that is the decision we would have to make because we certainly wouldn't want... I mean, there is, there is... My sense is that what the petitioner has been able to do is to get from a position where the government has said nothing to see here, to accepting there is something, to accepting there actually needs to be action and has commissioned that action. So I suppose the judgment call for us is in closing the petition, do we send a message that we've drawn a line under it, which I don't think we have, um, or that actually we think the most productive thing would be to have a petition that reflected the gap between the, what the petitioner wanted and what the National Action Plan itself was perhaps developed. Brian? If, if is, it, is it possible to leave the petition open and for the petitioner then to submit a separate petition on the back of the report? It's, 
Is that? <laughs> I know. Yes, I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, saying, do, do, if we do that, do we get the boat best of both worlds? One thing that we could do is we could write to the, the um, to the Scottish government, simply saying that we do expect progress and that we would expect to reconsider this if there isn't progress. So that kind of the foot's still on the pedal, but the, we're not looking as if we're doing something by simply letting a petition lie. Michelle? Yeah, I, I suppose um, I'm trying to, to stand in the petitioner's shoes and think what would I be thinking if it was if I was listening to this. Um, and the petitioner is, is very specific. She's looking for um, the development and provision of funding for a clinical pathway and services for adults with cerebral palsy. Now, obviously, the government are doing a national a action plan on neurological conditions, which is a, is a much broader... Um, look at things I guess and I suppose my, my slight concern would be that doesn't necessarily mean that I'll get anywhere near what I was asking for if I was the petitioner so I suppose my my slight suggestion on this is we're trying to second guess the petitioner's position um, so I think maybe we should write to the petitioner and say look you know we're concerned that there'll be a year's gap before it would come back to us because we'd need to wait and see what comes out of this action plan and consultation um, our suggestion is maybe that the best option would be to close it and then you could resubmit a petition if, if necessary when you see the outcomes. Would you be comfortable with that or are we missing something in terms of, of your thinking following your meeting in January? Um, I think I would be more comfortable to, to ask the petitioner what she's feeling um, and explain why we think that it, is, it would be logical from what we know to close it at this position. But she, she may have a view or a thought that we're missing because we weren't present at the meeting. It was eminently mm -hmm. sensible to me. Can we suggest no, that we yeah, do write actually, to the petitioner in, in those <laughs> terms yeah. and put the two options to her, but also acknowledge the progress that she's been able to secure already with the work she's done in the petition? OK, if that's agreed, then we shall write to the petitioner and subsequent to that make a decision on what action we'll take on the petition. OK, thanks very much. If we can then move on to the next petition for consideration... Um, which are, are petitions, petition 1610 by Matt Halliday and petition 1657 by Donald McCarry on behalf of the A77 Action Group. And can I welcome Finlay Carson, MSP, um, to the committee for this item. At our last consideration of these petitions in November, we heard evidence from the Minister for Transport in the Islands. The committee will recall that we covered a wide range of issues with the Minister, including previous investment in the road infrastructure, the rationale for building a single rather than a dual carriageway at Maybo, and the South West Transport Study that the Scottish Government has recently commissioned. A summary of our discussion is contained in our meeting papers. In recognising the particular concerns that have been raised in relation to the condition of the A75 and A77, and the impact this has on the economy of the area, the Committee asked the Scottish Government for information to understand the economic profile of Dumfries and Galloway. This information has now been received and is also contained in our meeting papers. Members will recall that the Committee asked the Scottish Government whether there was scope to pilot a 50 miles an hour speed limit for HGVs on the A77, similar to the pilot currently underway on the A9. The Government has responded by stating there are no plans to increase the HGV speed limit as there is insufficient evidence to justify a change. The petitioners have provided further written submissions in response to the evidence session with the Minister. They continue to raise concerns on a range of issues, including the impact of these roads to the economy, both across Dumfries and Galloway and Scotland more widely, as well as the decision not to pilot a 50 mile an hour speed limit for HGVs on the A77 and the options considered in relation to the Mayball bypass. Um, and wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action on the two petitions. I know Brian. You had a written parliamentary question that was due to be answered yesterday, and I wonder, A, has it been answered, and B, can you share its findings with us? Um, it has been answered um, with one line, uh, which basically says, no plans. Um, as, as you know, um, um, convener myself and, and uh, my colleague Finlay Carson have been um, quite vociferous in our, our, our sort of the way we've tackled th this and gone after this because uh, I've met with uh, Stenner recently um, uh, to specifically talk around their plans going forward, the investment they've made um, um, on the back of uh, conversations and, and promises made some time ago 
um, um, the and P and O are are uh, quite dis dismayed and disappointed at, at, at the lack of investment in the area. Um, and I'll also point to the fact that the route from Dublin to uh, Holyhead is p starting to pick up um, a lot of the, the, the traffic, the new traffic that's coming along, and that, is, that, that route is growing much faster. And again, Holyhead has, has had a significant investment in the infrastructure around there, and it's an inevitability that, that that will continue to happen. Um, I would throw my hat out here to say that I'm actually, uh, during the um, recess, I plan to uh, take the trip in an HGV to just to <laughs> just to get a, 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 a feel from them. But I travel that route, uh, the eight, specifically the A77, um, weekly. And and uh, I've actually been trying to raise this in Parliament over the last two or three weeks. The, 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 the way that route has crumbled since since this petition has been raised is quite frankly quite scary and uh, in fact the last time I was going down the route I, I uh, my, my passenger took a picture of an HGV overtaking a line of traffic of which I was in um, and and this is them on the charge to try and get to and, and that's no slight against the HGV driver but it's them on the charge to try and get to, to, to care Ryan and we now have we had the Ayrshire Transport Summit fairly recently, um, which was, was well attended by uh, MSPs and all the other parties in included. And, and it just keeps going back to the fact that um, the, the economy of the local area, uh, the safety now of, of that route, uh, are suffering so much uh, uh, now and are continuing to suffer. Uh, and my worry is now that, you know, we're here today, that, that there's, there's, uh, uh, there's movement on the issue of growth deal, which will only, uh, you know, quite rightly increase volume of traffic. Um, the whole infrastructure of that area uh, is now under review, but by the time that review has come out, which is now uh, the, the winter, next winter, if nothing is done on that road between now and then, it will be in the sea. I cannot stress enough how poor that, the, road, the, the state of that, that road is. And you've got 44 tonne lorries in convoy going up and down that route 26 times a day. That, that that road, by the time next winter comes along, that road, and I know the 75 is the same, but the 77 is going to be in the sea uh, the, the way it is just now. And I think somehow or other we have got to get some movement on this. Finlay? I, I, I would just agree with everything Brian said. Uh, we've got a fantastic opportunity with the Earth Growth, growth Deal, uh, the Borderlands uh, Growth Deal, and, and also the establishment of the South of Scotland Enterprise Agency. Now that has got to be underpinned by good uh, road and rail infrastructure. And at the moment, we're, we're looking at uh, the end of this year into the winter before we even get the, the review. I think everybody knows what the review is going to tell us. And, and there has been uh, a severe lack of investment in, in both A77 and A75. It can't be overstressed how key to the economic sustainability of Dumfries and Galloway and, and South Ayrshire so that these two roads are. Um, I, I can understand that we, we want to make decisions based on, on the evidence that's uh, put in front of us, but I would call on the, the, the strategic uh, review to be brought forward uh, so it can actually underpin these growth deals that we're, we're seeing being brought to the table right now. Michelle? Yeah, I, I find this slightly frustrating actually i mean i think when we did our, our visit down there and had a look at it and we talked to people and we talked to the, the shipping lines and it's quite clear that there is a major issue here um i found when we we had a conversation with the minister that quite frustrating because he's very seems quite dismissive you know um and i understand that you know there is only so much money and you have to make decisions about where it goes but it does feel like this is being allowed to disintegrate and the impact of its disintegration is going to be greater than just whether people can drive from A to B. You know, the, there is a, a, a big amount of economic reliance on this road um, and it, it is reaching a stage where, frankly, whether you put a, a single lane bypass at Mabel is going to be neither here nor there because the rest of the road will be all virtually unusable if it carries on. So, you know, and, and it is a time thing. You know, as the time goes on, the bill is getting bigger. So, you know, I, 
I would agree with Nick Carson. We could do with somebody somebody moving this down earlier, and and a proper assessment of, of what needs doing here. Um, I think in the first instance, we we probably need to go back to the minister and say, look, here are the points that have been raised. Yeah. Can you address these? Because I, I I don't think we've had satisfactory answers to the issues that are being raised by the petitioners. That's a, that's a, it mm -hmm. feels to me like that's a starter for ten. We yeah. should be asking. I think that the, um, on the Mebo bypass specifically, what evidence, mm -hmm. what options were considered, and you know what was the rationale for the decision they finally came to. And also, I was quite struck by the fact the minister said he would establish whether they would look at a pilot on. 50 miles an hour for each EVs then came back and said, we're not going to do that Well, because there wasn't evidence. So what was the consideration that was done mm. that between the minister saying you would look at it or find out and then them just simply come back and say, well, they're not going to do it. Um, I think there's two very specific things, but I think there are a number of other um, issues that are there as well. Brian? I mean, it's, not, it's not just about the economy of the area, and uh, the, there's there's a knock-on effect. For example, um, there's there's consideration we've given just now between uh, uh, treatment of cancer at uh, the Air Hospital and Kilmarnock Hospital, and the consideration is they're going to shut that treatment in the air and move it to Cross House, and the extra travel that that then entails. Now, if the route from you know up the S77 all the way down to to, to Governor Ballantry was was uh, of a much higher quality than the one that we're talking about. That that gives a different connotation to that that particular conversation, uh, in that then perhaps the the, the centralisation of that treatment in Kamar doesn't become such a big issue. When that when that road closes, which it closes many times, the 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 diversion that has to happen for ambulances coming up that road adds you know 40 minutes to an hour to a journey. So there's, it's more than just, I think we need to understand, it's more than just uh, an issue around uh, commercial uh, decisions, which which massively important they are. This is this is actually on, on people's day-to-day -day lives and their ability to, the ability to, to move up and down uh, that, that route to the, to the main conurbations in Ayrshire. So I just, I just want to say, I forgot to say that because I said lots. I just want to put that on the table as well. Okay. Rona? Just to say, um, you know, until we made our visit last uh, committee visit last year, I had absolutely no idea how how bad the conditions were down there, and I was shocked, to be honest. So I think when we write um, to the government, we should be asking, not just in retrospect about the Mabel thing, but also what plans are there to go forward? Um, ask them to come up with something concrete. They they must have it in their sights to do something. Um, nothing much more to add, convener. Uh, I tend to agree with everything that's been said, but um, I wonder if it's worth... I, I know uh, the two uh, local members have met with P&O and uh, Stenaline, but I wonder if it's possible to get an update from them on their stance. Um, I mean, they, they, did, they did give us evidence at, uh, when we were down, when we were down uh, in Dumfries and Galloway uh, on the on the committee visit, but um, the committee hasn't heard from them. Although local members have, so it'd be good to get their perspective on. on yeah. I was thinking that possibly we might want to invite representatives of the hauliers um, and the ferry companies. Now the question is whether we do that, sorry, in a committee session or a round table, which then allows community representatives or whatever also to be around. We need, is a question of the focus of that. So perhaps that is something that we can um, reflect on with the clerks, but I certainly do think it would be worth hearing from them in some way. And one other suggestion that, that we might want to look at is whether this would merit um, a committee debate in the chamber. Maybe once we've made a bit more progress with it, would again allow as Tyler, I think that the point that Rona makes is, is a telling one, that it's an issue that people are aware as something people locally are talking about. I think that broader question about the impact of the Scottish economy on safety is not so, and the delivery of public services is not necessarily something that everybody's alive to. Can I, I, can I can we, we, we could take that suggestion further um, in that I am quite convinced that, that, uh, that for example, Stena would host uh, a, a meeting like that at their, their, their headquarters, which would then allow the committee the opportunity to go down the 77 uh, and actually see it for themselves. And I'm quite sure if, if, if the committee was so minded mm. that asking... The, the Let's look at that, because I think there's a question about whether the authority of a public 
hearing in committee session may be a productive way of looking at it. And realistically, we're clear that we want to ask them for their, their views so we can write to them. But we then want to think about how best can we um, create a forum where those that yeah. broader issue it, it can be highlighted, or these broader issues can be highlighted, but we, we can maybe... Um, I can do that in consultation with maybe the deputy convener and the clerks about what would be feasible in that, if that was agreed. But as a minimum, we would certainly be writing to the Scottish Government and writing to these, um, both to the hauliers and to the, the ferry operators to get their views. Because I think this issue that's also flagged up in the papers about the way in which um, other lines um, traveling for travelling of goods are being developed, and therefore the impact in that Scottish economy is also kind of a, a question we want to look at. And Pina, could I could I just say that if if we are going to take um, views from from people like Stenner and Piano, I I personally think it would be quite good to have it in a formal evidence session, um, and maybe to add um, perhaps the ambulance service to that as well, um, because it, this is for me there's something about getting on formal evidence and allowing the wider population to be able to tune in and. and hear it and look at it as well oh. because our i mean our visit was really useful for us but it, it was very much a, a something that we all engaged with yeah. but it wasn't open let's and visible let's look uh -huh. at the format i think mm. that's that's the balance we want to strike and mm. you know we want to hear from the different voices but we don't we need to also have a focus so um you know there, there are a lot of different strands to this mm. but we can maybe look at how best that can and can be taken forward so if that's agreed, I don't know if there's any final comments, Finlay? I, I just want to thank the, the committee for, for absolutely putting this at the top of the agenda. Um, you know, the, the Transport Minister has said that on more than one occasion that it's it's in his, at the top of his entry. Um, but I would like to see at the top of his, his outry as something being dealt with. You know, we talk about it. Um, people in Dumfries and Galloway and, and, and those uh, on the, the sides of the A77 are, are very aware that it's been discussed, discussed up here, but we, we certainly need a, a way forward so we know that there's a time scale we're working to, whatever. I, I welcome Brian's comments uh, and, and Michelle Ballantyne's on, on, on ambulance service of what are. We've, we've got a, a health board that's looking to provide centres of excellence. But at the moment, there's, there's some patients in Sonar having to travel 75 miles uh, to Dumfries, and, and that's not that the patients are having to travel to the central belt for cancer treatment, and uh, the travel times and, and the safety on these roads got to be taken into consideration as, as long as as well as the the hauliers uh, and and the people using it to get to work every day. There's there's also the issue about um, you know going forward more centralised uh, health treatments, and and we need to be able to get to these uh, centres uh, safely, and that's that's certainly not the uh, the way people are travelling at the moment. Just a, 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 a final thought, um, just to ensure that when we write to the Scottish Government, can we ask them how members of the public can contribute to the South West Transport Study? Yeah. Okay. I think that's, probably an, that's also an, an important um, a point. And the, the importance of a, a good transport infrastructure matters, no matter where you're deciding you're going to put individual services. There will always be some services that are centralised and we want people to get to them safely so i think there's a, a number of issues there that we can um pursue and i do think we should probably flag up to the conveners group the, our interest in having a, a chamber debate at some point on this issue as well it may be at the beginning before the next stage or at a conclusion or we can we can make further decisions on that okay with that can i thank finley carson for his attendance and if we can move on to the final petition for consideration today which is petition 1627 by annette mckenzie on consent for mental health treatment for people under 18 years of age. We last considered this petition at our meeting on the 18th of January when we heard evidence from the Minister for Mental Health. The committee considered a range of important issues with the Minister, including the prescription of antidepressants to under 18s, GP training, early intervention and prevention measures, including CAMS service provision and issues related to consent. A summary of the discussion that took place is contained within our meeting's papers. In our written submission, the petitioner suggests a possible solution which may address the issue of consent for young people who have been prescribed antidepressants through the use of a written consent form. And I think there was also a submission circulated late, but which is now on the petition's um, webpage, and we also have access to it here. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Michelle? 
I'm, I'm really troubled, I have to say, by this petition. Um, and I'm really keen that we are progressing or endeavouring to progress down a route which makes real change, because I think there is an underpinning problem here in the way that um, when young people are going and seeking help, um, usually uh, often at a first port of call with a GP, that actually what what they're receiving is not a, appropriate. And, and I say that in a way that I'm not suggesting that GPs are deliberately or in other ways you know, not endeavouring to do their best, but I think the circumstances which are driven by 10-minute appointments, by very busy clinics, um, and I think in terms of the underpinning training and ongoing CPD that doctors are receiving um, mean that actually what we've got is fundamentally an inadequate approach to dealing with young people who are coming in with anxiety, depression, um, or... or feelings of inadequacy. Um, I think that it's clear from the evidence in front of us in our papers that GPs are struggling to get the kind of CPD they need, um, so whether it's updating on safeguarding, updating on mental health, updating on, on appropriate use of drugs, and combined with the other petition that's sitting with us on the impact of antidepressants, I think it paints a very troubling picture. So I... I would like us to go back to the, the minister um, and ask clearly about um, what she feels about the need for some engagement around written consent. Um, but I also think um, I would be keen to speak again to, to the GMC and say, OK, you know, we've seen what you've got to say about the process of training and the the elements that have to be undertaken, but we do think there's an issue here, um, and we would like your thoughts on, on what can be done to improve the engagement with young people, particularly around GPs. And I, I think the whole business of prescribing for young people when they come in, I think there needs to be a, a, a broader conversation about whether or not there should be some sort of stop on giving prescriptions to young people on a first visit to a GP. I mean, the sign guidelines clearly say that they shouldn't be prescribed um, until other therapies have been um, tried out, but clearly that isn't happening. We, you know, we have a number of pieces of evidence in front of us that indicate quite clearly that it is not uncommon practice for young people to be given a prescription on first visit. Um, and I think that alone sends shivers down my spine and certainly as somebody who's worked in children's services providing alternative therapies, I would I would be very concerned about any child being given a prescription on first visit and extremely concerned about them being given it without any other person being aware of it and being able to give support to that young person. And I think that is our current circumstance in the system that we have. Um, it is not about blaming any individuals, it's not about holding doctors to task, but it is about looking at a system that I think has a problem in it and addressing that problem, not not looking just in terms of exonerating individuals, but actually saying, look, we've got a system, systemic problem here that we need to address. Um, the petition is before us, and I think as a committee, um, it's something we need to drive forward um, and I think we need to discuss how we do that and whether we can do it in this short session I suspect is not the case and I wonder whether we should take it out of here and have a, a, a broader session on looking at what's going on and what might be the best way to approach dealing with this. Um, <coughs> I think you know, of, of all the petitions that we've heard in here I think this, this, this one is, is the one that's probably impacted me personally the most. Uh, I think it's one of the most important petitions that we've had here because I think, as, as um, colleague Michelle Ballantyne has highlighted here, it, it's raising a much bigger issue here. It's raising, for me, you know, a, a, a one of, for want of a better expression, the protection of our GPs. I think that uh, the CPD has not uh, kept pace with with the, the rise in, in mental health conditions. I think it's all well as saying they're not following the sign uh, the sign guidelines, and but that would then. It, it, that would then be educate that other therapies uh, and options are available to the GPs at the time. And I think um, 
uh, the, the, the idea that, that um, uh, young uh, uh, young youngsters can be given um, medication on a first visit to a GP just just frightens me. Uh, I, I can't tell you, and so I, I have to say I, I I think we need to have a particular longer session to look at this petition somehow or other. We need to be able to consider this in a much uh, in an environment that's not uh, so constrictive as we have in here just now. And I would be. I, I would back a call to to uh, to take a specific session on this if we could. Can I suggest that if, if we do that, what we're doing is implementing the public decisions we've made, and we would report back on those. So it just gives us a wee bit of space to kind of reflect on all of the evidence. It's not that we wanted to take it out of the public domain and not return it, but it would certainly give us a chance to kind of maybe think through some some of of these issues. I think for me, um, from the minister's evidence. I don't think we've got a satisfactory answer on to what extent um, prescribing um, antidepressant drugs or other drugs are the first port of call, the last port of call, when we know that the evidence, the guidance says it shouldn't be the first thing that's done. And the minister and her official didn't seem to be able to even give evidence of what happened. So they could say, well, you know, yes, the evidence is it's only where someone is in crisis. And I think that was a question for me. I think there's a question about access to CAMS, and this is something I've picked up elsewhere, that people feel that there's um, gatekeeping going on, which may be because the resource is so precious and so limited that it's ending up, that it's not something routinely that um, GPs can lean on. I do think we should be specifically writing to the Minister now and asking for her to comment on the petitioner's view on written consent and we didn't really get, and I can see what, where the complex, you know, if it were easy, it would have been sorted by now. But the question, the difference between going and telling somebody about somebody else's um, right to confidential advice and understanding that in circumstances like these, somebody would need a bit of, of support. The minister herself accepted that if it were cancer, then of course the family is brought in and how can we support the person with cancer? But the presumption is, that for somebody who's got a mental health issue, that that, that support wouldn't be as supportive. That support wouldn't be as positive a thing, and I think that is an interesting indication of the way in which we deal with mental health issues separately. And, and I also noted that from the evidence or the submission from the Royal College of General Practitioners, they talk about communication and consultation, and say. Um, that you know, to enable parents or carers, children or young people to participate in their own care, be routinely involved, but it actually flags up the need for confidentiality, balanced with the parents' need for information, and whether that is specifically for under 16s, I don't know. But that, I think that's just, I, I don't think this is just something that's absolutely black and white. Um, but there are there are issues here, and you know, how do you, how can you be as supportive as possible of somebody who may need particular treatments, but to look to reach out to people who would be supportive of them and, and allow them to be because I think again that is the petitioners has underlined this that even if she felt that it wasn't appropriate for the drugs to be prescribed, if she had known, it would have explained the behaviour changes and she might have been able to help with even dispensing the drugs. So I think there's there there are questions there. So um I think we do want to go back to the Minister with these points and if there are other points we want to flag up that should be included in the letter, I'll take them in a moment. Um, I do think we want an opportunity to, f to reflect a bit on how all the different ways in which we can pursue this. We do want to flag up to the Minister the question of um, written consent as highlighted by the petitioner. Are there any other issues that people would want to add to that? Rona? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, as, as has been said, my colleagues have said, it's just hugely troubling and and massively important um, this petition, and it encompasses so many different things um, that you know. I think we we have to just you know get, get as much um, information as we can. Um, so far, you know, the responses that we've had haven't added much. You know, to to I'm sure the petitioner won't feel that it's added much to to um, her reasons for bringing the petition. So we need to get closer to that. Um, Certainly, write to write to the government. Ask about the consent forms would, would be, you know, one aspect. But it definitely needs longer. I think this this is an issue that we can't do in, in fifteen minutes. Um, you know, every, every fortnight. I think we have to. It does need a longer session. It's a much wider issue. Um, so yes, I think 
what's been suggested is what we should do for now, but I think we need to look at it longer term as well. Yeah, you, you mentioned the issue of, of funding for CAMS uh, a wee while ago, convener. Um, I think the minister referred to extra funding that had come in. I think it was about 10 million. Um, but clearly there are capacity issues. There's no, no doubt about that. So um, uh, could we possibly write to young Scott for an update on the, the work of the Youth Commission to explore the extension of CAMS to uh, the age of 25? Yes. Uh, and also ask Health Improvement Scotland for further information about its work with health boards. Um, to improve CAM services in Scotland. Yeah. I mean, I know it would seem from what the Minister was saying, the intention is there to improve CAM services, but, uh, you know, funding is, is uh, and some clearly it, required. I mean, some of it may not be about funding as well. It may yeah. simply be the kind of, do we wait till somebody's crisis before we access support for them, or does CAMS have a role in preventative work? I, mean, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that, and I think certainly from evidence I've heard elsewhere, people who you would f have felt would have been seen as somebody who would access CAMS haven't been. So I think it's just quite interesting to explore that. And I think your suggestions around Young Scott and Health Improvement Scotland um, would, would help that. Um, and as we said, we want to write about the written consent forms. Perhaps we should ask them to reflect on the finding of the... Um, Sam H uh, survey regarding GP knowledge of sign and other guidelines um, and how they would promote the available guidance to all GP practices in Scotland. Um, I think we're agreeing that, that we, we will reflect on this in private, but we will uh, report back a, an evidence taking session, of, a, a public session of committee to reflect on what the conclusions of that would be at a future meeting, if that's agreed. Yeah. Anything else? No, I think there's, there's quite significant um, issues that I think they were flagged up from the Minister, but also from the submissions that we received that give us an opportunity to pursue this further. So if there's nothing else on that, um, can I um, indicate to everyone and hope they have a, a good recess, a happy Easter, and look forward to seeing you in the new session. With that, I'll close the meeting. <laughs>